so the next issue, the the, the next topic we're going to uh, broach here is going to be talking is going to be addressing the matter of protests occurring in Iran and how the U.S. has some sort of involvement in basically riling up these protests. So I read a great article from mintnewspress.com, which is a great uh, progressive website, independent media. And there was an article from a writer named Nafis Ahmed. And the title is... U.S. State Department spent over $1 million in Iran to exploit unrest. The subheadline says documents reveal regime change aspirations were pursued under the cover of democracy promotion programs. So that's really, really alarming. Somebody that is Persian, I have family that's that, that lives in Iran, my parents are from Iran. This is a really big deal because, the, the unfortunately, the the, you know, if, if some of you don't know, there was, there's been some uh, corruption issues. I mean, not that Iran has ever, you know, avoided, uh, you know, Iran's government has, has ever avoided being corrupt. But uh, there's some issues of corruption that have been, that have, come, you know, have arose from, you know, from within the government where um, apparently they have been, they've been accused of stealing money from a lot of the, you know, they've been stealing the, the, the savings of a lot of people, you know, a lot of citizens in Iran and stuff. And, you know, it's just a lot of, just a lot of financial corruption. That's obviously, and that's, you know, and when that's, when that's hurting your bottom line, just like in this country, when you're fucking hurting somebody's, you know, bottom line, they're going to get pissed. So, but I'm going to get into more detail about that in a second. But I just wanted to say that there, there have been a lot of protests occurring. You know, I live in Los Angeles and there was a lot of uh, people protesting, uh, pro protesting, in front of the, there was a federal building here that near my, near where I live. There was, um, you know, there's protests happening there. There's uh, people walking down one of the main streets here where I live. And they were, you know, they were chanting, holding up signs. Um, so it's a really, really big deal in a community where I live, where there are a lot of Persian people. There's a lot of Iranian people, a lot of people from Iran, a lot of, the, you know, people that obviously have family from, in Iran, just like myself. So it's a big deal. But let me, you know, I, I digress. Let me read the article here. So, um, yeah, so I already read the headline. So it says, at the end of 2017, a dozen cities across Iran, including the capital Tehran, were rocked by spontaneous protests, which continued into the new year. The protests drew attention to the country's deteriorating economic conditions, along with the regime's abysmal human rights record. They also paved, way, paved the way for President Donald Trump's announcement on January 12th that this would be a, would be a quote, last chance, end quote, for waiving U.S. nuclear sanctions under the Iran nuclear deal for a further 60 days, after which the U.S. would withdraw, would withdraw if it's quote, disastrous, unquote, uh, I'm sorry, disastrous flaws, unquote, c cannot be fixed. A range of recent uh, official documents from, from, from congressional research to U.S. foreign aid funding reports throw new light on the Trump administration's approach. The documents reveal the U.S. government's continued interest in trigger triggering major political change in Iran to pull the country into the orbit of American interests. This includes the possibility of exploiting political unrest and other crises, including a worsening water crisis, to turn popular opinion against the regime. So, there are... So, what people have to understand is that the people... Majority of the people in Iran do not support this government, of course. Why would they? It's a authoritarian government where... You know, to be fair, the, the you know Iran's people are n are much more secular than you know Saudi Arabia and and many other Middle Eastern countries out there, but you know which have authoritative regimes, and you know while they you know they a lot of them don't support the regime, so the 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 government run, run by Ali Khamenei and all that stuff, they they do they do not have the same idea and the same goal of regime change that the United States wants. So the neoconservatives and the many in many cases neoliberals in this country 
uh, the things that they uh, support and they want is that for they want regime change in Iran. And what that basically means is that they want a puppet government to be put, to be put inside Iran's government. And instead of, you know, Ali Khamenei and the Supreme Leader and all that stuff, they want a government that they can, you know, they can basically, you know, they can basically serve them. That's the basic idea behind what, uh, what America and the American government wants. And, you know, of course, as many people know, in, in, 19, in, the, in the 1950s, the, you know, the, the United States, the CIA, they, they overthrew the United States, they, they overthrew the Iranian government when Mohammed Mossadegh was there, and they overthrew him because he wanted to nationalize the oil industry. And, uh, you know, Iran had and it still has a lot of oil, and... You know, he wanted to nationalize it. You know, give it, give more of the 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 money that was being made off of that oil. He wanted to give it to the people. God forbid, what an asshole! You know, how could you do that? But of course, I mean, that's a totally humane thing to do. And once America, once you know, it, you know, many countries, uh, I'm sure many countries, you know, bordering Iran as well that are allies with America. Once they found this out, England and stuff, they they were all like, holy shit. We can't, we can't let this happen. We have to, you know, overthrow this government, you know, you know, start some sort of, uh, you know, protesting and, and different, you know, people getting upset, which is ironically what they're trying to do now. But, you know, do that so that, you know, you overthrow the government and then, okay, maybe hopefully we can put somebody in there. And then that's when they, and then that's when they managed to get the Shah of Iran in there. And then they got the, you know, they got the Shah government in there and that was eventually overthrown in 1979. And, um... But now that's give now that's given them uh, you know that's given them you know the, the basically the supreme leader so now they have even more authority because the Shah was already authoritative granted he wasn't as bad as um, as the current government right now but this government is worse so it's like it just it's it's just gotten worse and worse for the for the Iranian people so. Um, yeah, let me read the rest of it here. It says, Iran, Iran's unrest has mostly been driven by a convergence of domestic, ecological, energy, and economic rise, uh, crises. The State Department has sought to exploit these crises to undermine the legitimacy, legitimacy of the regime by funding opposition groups as well as anti-regime broadcasting to the, tune, to the tune of tens of millions of dollars a year. Jesus. Um, one stat, well, I'm sorry, one State Department funding document, for instance, refers to a project to use Iran's growing water crisis to drum up public anger against regime, quote, mismanagement, unquote. To date, U.S. government records show that the Trump administration has spent over $1 million, at least, since 2016 on financing anti-regime activism within Iran. The policy is not new, though. Altogether, since 2006, six, uh, successive U.S. administrations have, in, have invested tens of millions of dollars a year on, quote, democracy promotion efforts in Iran, serving as cover for long, long-standing, quote, regime change, uh, unquote, aspirations. Much of the media programming funded by the State Department has focused on glorifying the reign, or reign of the Shah of Iran, the brutal U.S. Uh, slash UK backed dictator who was deposed by the nineteen nine by the by the nineteen seventy nine revolution. The propaganda appears to have worked, with many participants in the latest protests calling for the Shah's exiled son Reza Pahlavi uh, to return to power in Iran. So let me just stop here and explain that a lot of the people that were protesting in my area here a lot of them were pushing the idea of like, yeah, the, you know, the Shah should come in. The, the Shah of Iran, Reza Pahlavi, he's the guy that can change everything and make everything better and everybody's going to be happy. But again, like I told you before, under the, under the Shah, which was, to be fair, it was his father. It was, it was, uh, it was uh, the father of Reza Pahlavi that was uh, obviously taking over. His, the, his son was obviously not old enough. He was not old enough to be in any position of power, and obviously he wouldn't have had that position of power at the time anyway. But he, um, the, the, his father was had a terrible, terrible reign reign as um, 
as the shop because a lot of people were, were pissed off about that they were pissed off about the fact that he you know that he was basically a dictator in his own right now maybe he was you know he had an, he put a nice smile on his face and you know he he seemed like a nice guy maybe whatever but he was still doing things to, to the you know to the iranian people that they did not appreciate unfortunately a lot of them still have their loyalists no matter what you're always going to have people supporting some form of government no matter what it is who it is and Obviously, he, you know, obviously Reza Pahlavi had that, and he was able to continue his reign until the 1979 when everything was overthrown. Now, a lot of the, a lot of that was because of the, again, back then, you know, uh, I'm sure the U.S. St tried to, tried to push a lot of their uh, propaganda back then too to say, you know, you should get rid of the Shah and put in the whatever a public government. But in reality, I mean. The idea of putting in a shot now would be just another step towards getting a more puppet government in there if, you know, if the shot wouldn't be already bad enough. So, yeah, but a lot of the people are falling for the bull. A lot of the Iranian people in America, and I'm sure in Iran too, are falling for the bullshit of like, oh yeah, put in a shot government, that's going to make everything wonderful, or it's all going to be puppies and rainbows. Of course it's not going to be. That's that's bullshit. No, anybody, you know, anytime you have, you know, a, 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 dict a dictatorship in power, it's going to be terrible. It's terrible now. It's not going to be any better under another one. It's just going to be the same thing. So, and the, you know, the rest of the thing here says, it says, uh, two congressional documents published early last year and one released just a month before the protests throw light on the Trump administration's policy of escalation in Iran. In Iran, the documents are research uh, are research reports published by the Congressional Research Service, written by Kenneth Katzman, a former CIA analyst specializing in Iran, Iraq, and the Gulf states. One document for, uh, uh, is titled "Iran's Foreign and De uh, Defense Policies," d dated February 6, 2017 describes how the administration's announcement placing Iran, quote, officially on notice, quote, unquote, could signal that, quote, the new administration might change U.S. rules of engagement to include the use of deadly force in future incidents, unquote. Um, let me read a little bit more here, and it says... The government's decision to, to, quote, at least maintain, if not increase, defense ties to the GCC, the Gulf Corporation Cooperation Council, states, are also, quote, pivotal to the U.S. efforts to counter Iran. There's another quote here. It says, the Trump administration has returned to earlier characterizations of Iran as an adversary whose, uh, whose mal malign activities and ballistic missile tests must be met with U.S. responses. The document warns that escalating indirect U.S. pressure on Iran could lead to the preemptive collapse of the nuclear agreement known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA. Uh, quote, military action to counter protests, to counter Iran's support for the Houthis or against Iranian ships in the Gulf could lead to a, lead to a pattern of escalation that causes a collapse of the JCPOA. Uh, uh, just to note, the Houthis are the Houthi rebels are fighting in they're fighting in Yemen right now, which is being you know just bombed the fuck out of by by the, by Saudi Arabia and backed by America. So the Houthi rebels are fighting against Saudi Arabia to protect the Yemeni people, and they don't want Saudi Arabia to fuck up at Yemen any more than they already are. But uh, I mean, at this pace, it looks like they're already going to be successful at that, unfortunately. But the Houthis are doing everything they can. And they are Shia Shia militia group. Um, again, backed by Iran. So, um, let's see. It says, the document also highlights the potential for an escalation of military activities to counter Iran led by the Gulf regimes. Quote, factors that could force a shift in Iran's foreign policy could include the expansion or institutionalization of a Saudi-led coalition of Arab Sunni states that might succeed in defeating movements and governments backed by Iran. Uh, a further congressional document authored by Katzman titled Iran, Politics, Human Rights, and U.S. Policy dated February 17, 2017, provides further detail on the Trump administration's attempts to escalate pressure on Iran. Under the heading, quote, Military Options, the document notes that that like obama president obama, uh, president trump has kept put quote potential military action against iran quote unquote on the table but has moved considerably close to this option 
the, administ the Trump administration has not stated a position on whether it would seek to change uh, Iran's regime, but its characterization of Iran as a U.S. adversary could suggest that the, the, that the administration might support efforts to oust the Iranian regime should opportunities do, to do so present themselves. So this is a very long article. I don't want to go through it you know, any longer here. Um, but if you would like, um, I'm going to post a link at the bottom of the, you know, at the bottom of the video here, just in the description box. Just check it out. It's a really, really good article from uh, Mint News Press. And check out more of Mint News Press. It's a very good publication. Um, but yeah, you know, the, a lot of this stuff, it, it's just, it's not surprising. The U.S. has always tried to make America, as the, the U.S. has always tried to make Iran more of its puppet just like any other Middle Eastern country out there. And, you know, I've seen, I've seen maps, um, I've seen this, this map before. It's just a made-up map that somebody made that showed how there's military bases in all the countries that are around Iran. So Iraq, Turkey, um, you know, Afghanistan, all these different Middle Eastern countries. And the only country that does not have a military, the only country that doesn't have any military bases that are American is Iran. And they're just Iran. The country of Iran is just surrounded by all these military bases and all these other and all these um, countries that are puppet governments to to the United States. And if once America is able to make Iran its own puppet, you know, government, another puppet government, it would that would basically be the nail in the coffin for the Middle East to be able to to be able to dictate its own choices and not be run by the government of the United States and not be told what to do and not and also the America not you know. You know, getting what it wants from that government, you know, so the le the 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 likelihood of that happening right now it seems very high with Trump in office, but I hope it really, I really, really hope it does not happen because that would be an awful, awful situation. And Iran needs to, you know, it needs to be as far away from being in the same to, to, to being in cahoots with america because america is just going to make things worse for them they are not going to improve it they all they want to do is just get uh, uh, iran's oil you know they want to tell iranians you know what to do how to think you know and stuff like that you don't need that shit you know the things are only getting worse and iran's going to turn into uh, afghanistan and iraq and all that stuff iran is you know find the way it is as far as as far as the way the way it is right now you know of course, like I said, the regime government is terrible. But as far as the, you know, the way the, you know, the way the country looks, it's in perfect shape right now. I mean, it's not, it's not a disaster like Yemen and Libya and, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, all these different Pakistan, Somalia, everywhere. Those countries are all in fucking ruins right now because America's, you know, bombing the shit out of them. You can add Niger onto that list now too. So that's eight countries that we're constantly, we're currently bombing right now. Imagine if Iran becomes that because we want to do a regime change. It would be an awful situation. And that's the last thing Iran needs.